Um, I'm going to talk about inventing tradition at Brown. When I mentioned to people I was going to give this talk, uh, most of them replied, well, of course, aren't all traditions invented? So, yes, I can perhaps pack up now and we can go to the reception, right? Um, but I think I'm going to talk a little longer. Um, I'm going to argue that not all events become traditions. Some traditions disappear while others take their places, and there are often reasons for the rise and fall of traditions. Traditions can take many forms. They can be attached to physical objects like the um, Van Wickle gates, mascots like the brown bear, or clothing like wearing brown insignia on a sweatshirt. They can also be songs or their parodies or their social practices like many student activities. This initial slide shows some of the brown traditions I am going to talk about. Uh, the Van Wickle Gates, of course, Spring Weekend, Midnight Organ Recitals in Sales, The Brown Bear, and Josiah Carberry, the elusive professor of psychoceramics or cracked pots. I'm going to trace their development and talk about a few of the traditions that have disappeared. I'm going to talk about the purposes they serve for the apparently 13,000 people who currently study and work at Brown and the many, many thousands of alumni who've passed through the symbolic and traditional, but since when, Van Wickle Gates. Traditions are very useful. They socialize new students, they create community and a sense of belonging, and they can also distinguish Brown or any place from other institutions. The Brown Bookstore used to sell a sweatshirt with Harvard's logo on it with the message Harvard because not everybody can get into Brown. They can also be fun and even the most skeptical can smile at them and take them with a grain of salt. I was asked to do this talk by the people at the Hafenreffer Museum and who recently mounted this exhibit in Deo Sparamus, the symbols and ceremonies of Brown University, which is in Manning. And I think we'll all desire, de deserve a glass of wine after this, so we should all go and see it then. I hope there is a glass of wine there. Right. Um, so those of you who haven't seen it already ought to go and see it. Um, it's curated by uh, Professor Bill Simmons and is quite fascinating. Um, it's a really interesting glimpse of some of the symbols of Brown that make up part of, an important part of Brown's traditions. Now, the, the crest on the left-hand side of this uh, screen is part of Brown's third official seal, the seal they put on documents. It was designed in 1833-34, uh, when someone had noticed they were still using the second seal, which referred to Brown by its former name, Rhode Island College. So it had only taken them 30 years to notice that. Instead of the four books and In God We Hope, uh, the previous seal apparently had a, something called a temple devoted to knowledge and the motto, Open to Everyone, which is quite appropriate considering Brown's charter. The gates and the bear seen over there in some of Brown's promotional material have also changed over time. While the traditions attached to them seem to have been there forever, both of these symbols first appeared in the first decade of the 20th century. The gates in uh, 1901, the bear in 1904. And as I'll show you, some of the traditions attached to them took time to develop. The early 20th century was a time when universities, including Brown, were changing. They were transforming themselves from colleges serving a small number of Anglo-Saxon men to larger institutions which were beginning to incorporate women, Jews, Catholics, African Americans and others into the student body. But just like uh, the Americanization of immigrants' children in the public schools, these new students, it was assumed, needed to be assimilated into college life. Diversity was not yet a goal. At Brown and elsewhere, there were deliberate attempts to establish tradition. The Brown Alumni Monthly started publication in 1900. President Force, seen here as a young man, most of the pictures we see of him are as an old guy, but he was only about 40 when he took over at Brown. Um, Fawns once said that college was a waste of time if the graduates remembered nothing but their textbooks. 
He wanted the alumni to recall, and I quote, those rich memories and traditions which are the natural and in some ways the best product of college life, hoping to make it impossible for any alumnus to make his will without remembering Brown. So there are a little bit of an ulterior motive going on there. The book, Memories of Brown, uh, was published in 1909. You can read it online should you want to. It is quite delightful. It was a series of essays, mostly humorous, written, written by alumni, and was part of the myth-making and tradition-making of the early 20th century. It's full of stories of misdeeds and youthful pranks including lots of bonfires. I, I read this with some students a couple of years ago when I did the seminar. They kept saying, another bonfire? <laughs> They're burning things again. Um, athletics, ways of differentiating Brown from other colleges and general misbehavior. Now, I've just taken a few um, essay titles out from this part of the table of contents. Devolution of the bonfire beating Harvard and Yale in 79, how 84 worried a professor, a fight with the fireman in 1899. That is one of the less agreeable things because there's a sort of class thing going on here where the working class Rhode Islanders were fair game for college boys who were going to set fire to things. In the early 20th century, college life was characterized by the so-called college man, who was imbued with the so-called college spirit, which meant he either played sport, edited a literary magazine, or sang in the glee club, perhaps all three, and generally contributed to the life of the university. This idea of the college man developed in the 19th century, when there were very few distractions from rote learning. Many college campuses saw revolts, some of them violent, and people got killed occasionally. The faculty was seen as the enemy. The curriculum was not all that was relevant. Teaching methods were very dull. Work was to be done as little as possible. Cheating was commonplace, and the gentleman's sea was alive and well. So, the students created their own extracurricular world, setting up contests between classes, founding fraternities and debating societies, and creating traditions that were handed down from one class to another. The authorities, particularly Wayland, became suspicious and tried to control the students' extracurricular life, sometimes tried to suppress it altogether. And often the students fought back. In the 1840s, when President Francis Wayland tried to stop a student group from meeting on Friday evening, Saturday afternoon was the time, but no, they wanted to be really radical and meet on a Friday evening. The next day, a marble bust of the president was discovered perched in a tree. Wayland was not amused. President's cows and horses were frequent targets of students' revenge. One of the perks of Brown's 19th century presidents uh, was free grazing for their cows on what is now the main green, but was then just a field. Wayland wasn't happy when students took his cow up the stairs in University Hall, tied her to the bell, or the bell pull, and locked her in. And the bell rang for hours until the cow was rescued. So when I was preparing for this, do this talk, I decided to go on a campus tour. Uh, you've probably seen them. Uh, students walking backwards, followed by a crowd of parents and teenagers looking various degrees of interested and bored. I soon discovered that when Brown students conduct these tours, they pass on Brown traditions, some of which have a long and honorable history, some of which are much more recent and are very dubious. The guide on my first tour, though totally charming, was a little historically challenged. So I decided to go again. The second and third tour guides were very impressive, and this, these are from the third tour that I went on, so we will forget the first one, shall we? Now, the first thing they want to tell you about um, is the Van Wickel gates. And the tradition, as I'm sure you know, is they only open twice a year, once inward, once outward, to admit freshmen and send graduates out into the world. But all three of the guides then added they sent them out into oncoming traffic, which is absolute nonsense because no traffic for miles around. But anyway, the tradition has emerged. Um, that, this tradition that has emerged is one of those that confer bad luck 
on the unwary. So being in the know that a male student won't graduate if he goes through more than once, or a female won't marry, is important, even if the student doesn't really believe it. The brown band, seen at the right, has to go through several times, and here they are looking very seriously at an open gate. To avoid the curse, they're said to hop. And two of my tour guides described an enterprising tuba player who is said to have tried to climb over the top. The gates were dedicated on June the 18th, 1901. I don't know if they were kept open or shut at that time, but shutting them would be part of the trend to cut the college off from the town, which was also symbolised by the erection of the wrought iron fence. The gates were definitely open a few months later when former President Andrews visited campus to the delight of students who unhitched his carriage and pulled it and him up the hill and through the gate. They were also opened in October 1917 to let a procession commemorating 25 years of the Women's College to pass through on their way to the First Baptist Church. By the late 1920s, they were clearly closed most of the time and opened at the beginning of the semester, as Fawns uh, in 1929 described the Van Wickle gates as, quote, springing widely open again to welcome the students. But it seems, from what I read, that the whole student body passed through. The continuation of all comers seems to have been modified by 1943, when a student described passing through as a privilege of juniors. Now, the origin of these two traditions, the bad luck and the only twice a year opening, seem to be lost in the mists of time. So, again, while we have a glass of wine, or, or at some other time, let me know if any of you can help me on nailing down when these things actually started. Now, while we're thinking about the um, function of the traditions, a little background on the Gates donor. Uh, who was Augustus Stout Van Wickle, there's a fine name, class of 1876, and here he is. He died in a skeet shooting accident, which shouldn't happen, in 1898, aged only 42. Now, Mr. Van Wickle seems to have liked gates, because he also left money for, to Princeton for a gate, although he'd only ever been to Princeton once in his life. It's the top right on this slide, um, and it's named the Fitz Randolph Gateway in memory of a Van Wickle ancestor who gave the land upon which Nassau Hall was built. Like Brown's Gate, traditions grew up around the Princeton Gate, which was permanently closed except for special occasions. This changed in May 1970, when Princeton students protesting the Vietnam War, the Cambodian invasion, the Kent State shootings, demanded that after the graduating seniors had walked through, the gate should be left open. According to the Daily Princetonian, this was, quote, intended to symbolize the seniors' commitment to those outside the university. Now, although Brown students also protested at commencement in 1970, 70, their wearing of white armbands didn't result in any change to the gate opening policy. But there was a change to commencement traditions in 1969, however, when there was a risk of student disturbances and a much slighter risk of rain. So the march was cancelled, and although the gate stood open, no one went through. The graduation was held in Meehan that year, though a symbolic ceremony, you can see here, was held in the First Baptist Church with rows of empty seats, as you can see. Student protest was one of the traditions the campus tour did not address. But protests go back to the earliest days of the college. This one in 1835 was interesting uh, and foreshadowed the one that you may be more familiar with, with the black walkout in 1968. This gentleman on the left is Brown's first Latin American student, Jeronimo Ermenuta from Chile. Together with 22 out of the 25 students in the class of 1835, he refused to graduate. Uh, in protest at what the students thought were undemocratic arrangements for the commencement exercises, whereby the names of the students were printed on the programme in order of merit. So it became very clear who was bottom of the class. 
Despite numerous polite requests and petitions from the students, Wayland refused to budge. So the students walked, or rather they didn't walk, and only three degrees were handed out that day. It must have been a very quick commencement. Eventually, Brown revent relented and awarded the 22 their degrees, but some of them posthumously. 133 years later, in December 1968, the African-American women of Pembroke convinced most of the black men at Brown to join them in a walkout. The quiet removal from campus was in contrast to some other colleges in 1968, where protests became violent. They were more successful than the conscientious class, the women, because Brown agreed to aff some affirmative action measures to agree to increase the number of black students admitted, to increase their financial aid and hire more black faculty and staff. Now, although the John Hay Library is closed for renovation, I got a look at the script the students work from, which is full of strange things, which includes a reference to another good luck custom, rubbing John Hay's nose. And here are two students rubbing his nose. Presumably this year, when they can't get to him, nobody's going to pass their exams. I don't know. The library was dedicated in, on November 11th, 1910, and Hay's widow, Clara presented this bust of her late husband, and it stands with its shiny nose in the lobby. Students have traditionally rubbed his nose for good luck. The extremities of statues at a number of campuses are also supposed to bring good luck. But the rubbing of John Harvard's toe, which you can see on the right there, was completely invented in the 1990s by tour guides. Not even Harvard tour guides, but public tour guides, who thought this was an amusing tradition. Um, an expert at Harvard has calculated that the rate of rubbing that's going on, his toe could be entirely rubbed away in 166 years. A tradition um, our student tour guides don't mention about John Hay is the story of his experimenting with drugs. One of his classmates, who became a very senior minister, reminisced in Memories of Brown about the day in 1858 when Johnny Hay took hashish in Hope College, saying it was a day to remember, although he was irritatingly unclear about Hay's reactions. A story that puzzles me and which was told practically word for word by all three of my tour guides was the story of the missing bell in the Carry Tower. As you can see, there is no bell on the right there now. They claimed that the bell was only rung on momentous or unusual occasions, such as a world war or Brown winning a football game. This part of the story always elicited a small laugh from the audience, but the small but that the bell had been removed, moved to above University Hall, where it now rang for the beginning and end of classes. There are several problems with this story. University Hall has always had a bell. Recall the president's cow being tied to it in the 1840s, and the Carry Tower bell rang regularly at least till the 1950s. In 1937, for example, uh, a group, a non-fraternity group, which welcomed all those excluded from regular fraternities was set up and called itself the Tower Club because they heard the bell ring at eight o'clock while they were deciding on a name. So why the story? One possibility is the tradition of self-deprecation. Saying Brown football team rarely won was like saying we're different, we're a school where sport is not all that important to our self-image and we can live with that kind of failure. The story connected with the nickname of the John D. Rockefeller Junior Library plays a similar function. John D. was a member of the class of 1897 and a generous donor to Brown. I heard two versions of this, but even the alumni website uh, is dubious about the truth of the story, which goes that when the John D. Rockefeller Junior Foundation learnt that students were calling the library the Rock, they supposedly wrote to the BDH and asked students to please call the library by its full name. In protest, the story goes, Brown students started calling the library the John. Pretty soon, the John D. Rockefeller Junior Foundation wrote back to the BDH, giving Brown students the OK to call the library the Rock. But so far, I have found no documents to support this, but they may be there. So why the story? 
Having a familiar name and nickname for a building helps cre create a sense of belonging, of identifying with an institution. And the tinge of lavatory humour just enhances the sense of being an insider. I went on the general tour. I imagine the athletics tour would have spent more time with sporting mascots, and we passed by various Brunos without comment. In the early 20th century, many colleges decided they needed a mascot. Brown's first was a rather shy burrow in 1902, but he was terrified by the crowds <laughs> and was soon replaced by a bear. T.F. Green, bottom right there, class of 1887, one of Brown's most faithful alumni, was behind the choice of a bear, writing in words which totally reflect the traditional notion of the college man, here I quote, while it, the bear, may be somewhat unsociable and uncouth, it is good natured and clean. While courageous and ready to fight, it does not look for trouble for its own sake. It is intelligent and capable of being educated, if caught young enough. The first live bear appeared at a football game against Dartmouth in November 1905. Unfortunately, the bear they originally tried to rent from Roger Williams Park Zoo refused to leave his cage. So his mate Helen, and that is she, uh, was hired instead. From 1921 onwards, Brown had a series of live bears, all called Bruno, and there's one being taken on an aeroplane. Uh, after 1925, they were kept in a cage under the football stadium. I'm not sure whether that was always true, but certainly some of the time. By the 1960s, animal rights sentiments meant a live bear was no longer acceptable, and so the last live bear appeared in 1966. Now, as soon as we got onto the main green, all three students' guides started talking about spring weekend. Celebrating in the spring is a long tradition, going back to time immemorial, and Brown students have been doing it for a long time. In the 1870s, it was already a long-established practice of programs where juniors mocked their professors and which, according to President Ezekiel Robinson, had, quote, reached a stage of indecency and blasphemy. By the 20th century, senior frolics, organised by serious young men, just as the ones on the left here, were annual events. But Spring Weekend in its present form was introduced in 1968 by Ira Magazina. That year, they had James Brown, Dion Warwick, Procol Harum, the Yardbirds, Dizzy Gillespie, plus Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlighetti, a who's who of the late 1960s. While we were on the main green, all three of my guides started talking about student organisations and particularly mentioning the a cappella tradition. Singing goes way back at Brown. Indeed, a student wrote very sadly in his diary in 1825 that new rules introduced by President Wayland prevented him from singing in his room after nine o'clock in the evening. Quote, thus he has deprived us of a privilege which we esteemed very valuable he wrote. In the late 19th century, musical clubs abounded, such as glee, banjo, mandolin, symphony, and soon the women's college had their own glee club. The two glee clubs merged in 1948, which is the bottom left uh, image here, part of the general post-World War II merging of Brown and Pembroke. And the following year, 1949, saw the founding of the first of the for first of the a cappella groups, the Jabberwocks, who are a modern version down there. The director of the Glee Club was not amused by them, calling them, quote, a misguided small group of students whose product is a kind of vaudeville. But they survived rather better than the Glee Clubs and created a new brown tradition. Co-ed a cappella had to wait till 1983, and that's the original higher keys at the top right, and they're there in the middle there. In talking about the plethora of student groups, now Steve will like this one, two of my guides mentioned the Beard Appreciation Society, so I couldn't resist putting the taxidermists in from an 1880s yearbook whose leader, Professor John Whipple Potter Jenks, ran an optional taxidermy class on Saturdays 
in the basement of Rhode Island Hall. And it made me feel that there were continuities in student traditions, whether or not anyone knew. The tours all went through Sales Hall, where, rather than talk about the worthies lining the walls, with the honourable exception of, James, of Nicholas Brown, who one of the three guides identified as John Brown, they all concentrated on the midnight organ recitals, adding the glorious detail about the organist being carried in, or perhaps out, in a coffin and Halloween. I felt I had to find out about this, so I emailed Mark Steinbach, the university organist, and his reply is very interesting about the invention or reinvention and then elaboration of tradition. This is what he wrote. I reinstated the Midnight Halloween organ recital in 1993 when I began as university organist at Brown. The organ was in a state of disrepair during the 80s and was only made playable again in 1990. I had heard stories of my predecessor's predecessor who used to play midnight organ recitals at sales in the 70s and thought it would be a fun way to showcase the amazing instrument there to the students. It works. More than 500 people turn, typically turn up to these events. They sit or lie on the floor on pillows or blankets enjoying the music. He goes on. My show has evolved to include costumes, including having the audience show up in costume, and various theatrics, which may change from year to year. Yes, I have a coffin, which I do employ, but I can't give away all my secrets. I also give a midnight recital on Labor Day at midnight now and have for at least 12 years as part of orientation. The students themselves put on a midnight concert in December at finals time with an a cappella groups doing the annual holiday sing and then students of mine play several pieces on the organ. Now those two paragraphs just encapsulate the whole thing that I'm talking about because these organ recitals now are a combination of student, faculty and administration activities which are all somehow melded into one. The mention of coffins, however, brings us to junior burials, which is one of the most colourful 19th century traditions, which have gone. They were highly organised affairs whereby juniors ceremonially drowned, burned or otherwise disposed of some of their textbooks. An elaborate procession would wind its way from campus to a wharf at Fox Point, whereupon the coffin with the books was placed on a boat, rowed down the river and thrown in the bay. The middle image, um, the junior burial of 1859, mentions a torchlight procession. And the image on the left shows them marching class by class, all bearing torches and looking a bit like members of the Ku Klux Klan. Most of the junior burial ceremonies involved speeches, poems. Indeed, John Hay wrote a poem for one of them. Although these burials were interrupted by the Civil War, they resumed as cremations after the war, though they were getting increasingly bitter against their professors, as the image on the left shows. This fellow faculty who's tied to a stake down here, I think is the one who committed suicide a few years later, after having a nervous breakdown and overwork and all those other things. Um, the juniors at this point were describing faculty as, quote, unforgivable parents of such arid, wearisome stuff. So junior burials died out in the 1880s. But some student guides all said that the freshman organ concert in sales helped the, the freshmen feel part of the Brown experience. But this cosy sleeping bag event arranged by the university as part of orientation is very different from the ways students initiated each other in the past when class solidarity was the main issue. Ritualised fights between classes were traditional until comparatively recently. These images show a cane rush, which was particularly popular in the 1780s. And the class of 78 is there having vanquished 79 and... 80, I think. Um, President Robinson c 
complained that he sometimes found himself conducting morning prayers in an almost empty chapel while the students enjoyed a freshman sophomore concert outside. He said, and I quote, these cane rushes could happen at any hour of the day or evening. There were nightly bonfires with horn blowing and occasional hazing of a green freshman. And he added, drastic, drastic measures became a necessity. This again is part of the Brown tradition. Students pushed and the admi administration pushed back. Students have traditionally imposed, imposed clothing rules on younger students and these often involve the wearing of certain clothing like beanies. This one is from Ohio State. I had terrible problem finding a, a brown beanie but it they looked like that but brown. Uh, the brown freshmen had to wear them at all times within the city limits, i.e. not just on campus, and they were ceremonially burnt at the end of the year. Beginning in the early, in, in the early 20th century, the administration began leaving part of student discipline in the hands of students themselves, and a particularly chilling example of which was the case of William Kolodny, a transfer student in 1917 who refused to wear his beanie. Uh, student leaders remonstrated with him, politely at first, and eventually they grabbed him, ducked him under the pump, pump outside um, Hope College, which was a traditional place for such things, uh, then tied him to a chair and painted unfit in iodine across his forehead. He appealed to the president and the dean, whose reply was that if he couldn't conform to student, con student tradition, there was nothing they could do to protect him and he left. Meanwhile, more conformist freshmen didn't wear their galoshes unbuckled, didn't wear a straw hat before Memorial Day, and didn't smoke on campus. Infractions of the clothing code sometimes led to violence. In 1929, there was a tunnel riot, which began when freshmen were frustrated in their efforts to burn their black neckties, as the sophomores had already lit the bonfire. The disappointed and angry freshmen marched downtown in their pajamas. There was a pitch battle with the police, shots were fired, and three policemen and several bystanders were seriously hurt. In 1952, as this issue of the Brown Daily Herald shows, there was beginning to be some opposition to some of the traditions. Dinks, you see the right hand heading, dinks were beanies. And some bold freshmen burnt them outside Fawn's house, despite the ban on bonfires on the green. But meanwhile, they were singing, I'm a brown man born, while their beanies burned. They also tried to dismantle the Hope College pump, the one I showed you a minute ago, um, traditionally used to douse the heads of recalcitrant freshmen. The other headline in the middle here, uh, 55 class council to discuss hazing by all sophomores mentions that it is a formal program, that hazing is a formal program, quote, quite, quote, culminating in an afternoon of athletic competition which includes the traditional flag rush. The traditions surrounding Josiah Carberry, professor of psychoceramics or crack pots, are kept alive by alumni, the library and some faculty, though most students are mystified by the appearance of cracked bean pots like that one every Friday the 13th. The pots have a useful purpose, however. As you can see from the book plate, they pay for books of which Professor Carberry may or may not approve. Carberry, a whimsical, pure invention, was, quote, born on a notice board in University Hall in 1929 and soon acquired a wife, daughters and a passion for travel, though he never managed to appear for one of his scheduled lectures. And there he is, wandering down College Hill when he should have been doing something. The New York Times proclaimed him the world's greatest traveler in 1974, and the Brown Archives has a collection of postcards sent by Professor Carberry from the four corners of the earth, usually explaining why he couldn't um, be there to give a lecture. Enthusiasm for Carberry continues. A few months ago, there was a premiere of a film called, quote, Made Not Born, The Wife and Dimes of Josiah Carberry. 
There is a Carberry cookbook, but while some of the recipes call for unusual ingredients, such as his puffin burgers, it also includes Carter Brown's recipe for boiled water for those who can't cook. Burning anything combustible was a favourite occupation of students for many years, and bonfires were lit on almost any excuse. Football victories were a favourite. This is the one on the left, which is from a 1880s uh, yearbook. Uh, and the photograph on the right, which is as clear as I could make it, uh, was of a bonfire after Brown had defeated Lafayette College in, I think, about 1905. If you look carefully, you can see chairs and window frames and branches leading, reaching high into the sky. My last slide is water fire, which is now a symbol of providence. And it was devised by Barnaby Evans, Brown class of 1975, where he was a concentrator in biology and environmental science. But whether he realized it or not, Barnaby was part of a continuing fascination with fire at Brown University. In conclusion, Traditions, however historically unreliable, are important. Some emerge from student life, from a traditional opposition to authority among the young. Some were devoted, sorry, developed to encourage alumni to be part of the university and perhaps give money, while others were part of the authority's efforts to control student behavior. Whatever the underlying reasons, traditions create a sense of belonging, or alternatively, something to be scornful of and reject. They socialize individuals, they inculcate beliefs and value systems and conventions of behavior. Many traditions emerge in response to new circumstances, and they are being constantly invented and reinvented. And they'll continue to do so as long as there are people, places, and institutions, and as long as people are willing to tell the stories. Thank you. <laughs>